St. Peter warns us, be sober and vigilant, for the devil is like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. Yes, the devil is real. And in preparation for this talk, I interviewed an exorcist, one of the people who battles the devil daily, on a daily basis. And it was shocking to hear what he said. He said, right now we're seeing unprecedented activity, astronomical increases in demonic activity. He says, right now it seems like the Lord is draining the spiritual swamp. If you can allow him to use that Trumpian reference there. <laughs> but it's for real. He says this last month in the Archdiocese of Washington, they had 18 different evaluations for possible demonic activity in that archdiocese alone. 18. He says that men, there's an all-out attack on men right now. Why? Well, the Father protects not only the physical, but also the spiritual dimension of his family. So you take out the Father, and then you can also take out the children and the rest of the family. He said that pornographers place onto their product curses, demonic curses, so that when a man is sinning mortally with pornography, he's also opening the door to a demon to become attached to that man. What happens then? That demon is attached to the man, and then he has free reign on the family. He can then attack the children and the wife. Yes, the devil is real. Just ask an exorcist. Just ask an exorcist about the demons. And it's hard not to believe in the power of the demonic when you open up the newspaper right now. And you see what happened with Cardinal McCarrick abusing seminarians, abusing children, minors. How did this guy get ordained? How, how is it possible that this man then became a bishop, an archbishop, and finally a cardinal? It's enough to want to take my hand and punch him right in the nose. Okay, calm down, Jason, calm down. Calm down. But I believe that I do have our Lord in my corner who said what? It's better that you put a millstone around one of these people and throw them into the deepest sea than that one little one can be scandalized. That one child can be scandalized. It's better to throw them into the sea. We look then. That was strike one with McCarrick. Strike two this summer. The summer of hell was what? Pennsylvania. The grand jury report. 1,000 children, victims, 301 predator priests. And when you looked at that report, I, I was there the day that it was released in Pennsylvania, and the, on stage with, with the Attorney General of the state were some of the victims, and, and it was just so incredible to watch them and, and not to get choked up. These people's whole lives were destroyed. The person that they trusted to be closest to God ripped them away from God giving them a lifetime of terror, a lifetime of nightmares, a lifetime of doubting God's power. When you look at that grand jury report, and, and I don't recommend reading it, it's very demonic and, and, and pornographic at times, but it, we do bring light to the darkness at this moment. And when you read through it, it's like the demons had put their calling card on, these, on the situation, right? There was the use of holy water, the blessed sacrament, and the crucifix in the most reprehensible ways you could ever imagine. It's like the demons were putting their calling card right on what they were doing there. Pope Paul VI said, from some crap the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God. From some crap the smoke of Satan has entered the temple of God. Why does the devil do this? We can't attack God. God is all-powerful. He can't go after God. But who does he hate the most? And I, I think this isn't, this isn't in the catechism, but I, I think he goes after the priest because what does a priest do? The priest exercises demons. The priest releases people from the power of 
hell by forgiving their sins. And what does he do on the altar? He brings the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So yes, this, the demons want to attack the priest because if he attacks that one and brings that one man to hell, not only that man could go, but think about the whole parish. Think about all the people that are scandalized by that one priest and then can join, that can stop going to church, abandon their faith because of the sins of that one man. So every night our priests used to reflect on this reading from 1 Peter 5. The devil, your opponent, is like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Now it's prayed, I think, every Tuesday night as part of the night prayers, the final prayers of the night. He's prowling. Who is he looking for? He's looking for you. He's looking for me. As that exorcist told me, there's an all-out war right now on man, on the man, on men, on fathers. I remember when I lived in New Haven, right down the road, and uh, I was on Whitney Avenue. I loved it down there. Uh, but on Whitney Avenue was, as you know, the largest abortion provider in the country is Planned Parenthood. And there was a big regional headquarters there for Planned Parenthood. And it'd be late at night. I'd be walking back or driving back to my, to my apartment. And you'd see a light on here or a light on there. They were plotting. I wanted to go home and have a beer put my feet up, relax, but they were still working. They were still working that evil that comes along with abortion. The devil is a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. And we can't say we weren't warned, right? 101 years ago, Our Lady appeared in Fatima to three shepherd children, and she provided those children with a vision of hell. And that vision of hell changed their entire lives. They, they wanted to spend the rest of their days bringing people closer to our Lord, doing penance, praying, because hell was so real. The vision of hell was so terrifying that they wanted to do everything they could to save people from hell. One of the girls later described it like this, what her vision was. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. The Bible presents a picture of hell as well, an unquenchable fire, a place where the worms never die, brimstone and fire, unquenching fire. But the worst thing about hell is what we see Jesus say. We do never want to hear these words said to us at the end of our lives, which is Jesus, the just, just judge, saying, depart from me into everlasting fire. Right now I'm part of a book club at my kid's kindergarten and we're not reading Peter Rabbit or any of these other great books for kids. These adults are coming together to read uh, Dante's Inferno, one of the greatest poems of all time. It's a lot longer than a poem. <laughs> but uh, this poet, this Catholic imagination is, is also terrifying when he paints a picture of hell. Now the choirs of anguish like a wound strikes through the tortured air. Now I have come to hell's full lamentation, sound beyond sound, I came to a place stripped bare of every light and roaring on the naked dark like seas racked by a war of winds. Their hellish flight of storm and counterstorm through time foregone sweeps the souls of the damned before its charge. St. Thomas Aquinas presents a picture of hell, which is not just the fires, which is what I think we always visualize, but also cold. So you've got this back and forth where you go super hot, you know, the flames of hell, but then also the bitter cold. And that's the picture he paints of hell. But he says the worst torment of hell is not the physical pain, it's that separation from God, that being separated from God is the worst punishment of hell. St. Alphonsus of Gori said the greatest sorrow is knowing that we lost God by our own freely done faults, our own freely done sins. And St. Augustine says the damned spend every day just thinking about God, the God that they spent their lifetime trying to ignore. So what am I trying to do up on this stage it is true, I am trying to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> Why is the devil seeking us? Because he wants us on that highway to hell. He wants to see you, who could go to heaven, not go to heaven where he can no longer go. Uh, I did a retreat, the St. Ignatian, uh, it's a 40-day retreat. I didn't do 40 days, I just did like three or four days. But the first week of that retreat, uh, the spiritual exercises is, all focused on, on sin, all focused on hell. It's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty startling to reflect upon. 
but he asks you to, to use your senses, to use your imagination, uh, your, your scent, hearing, feeling, and, and smell as well. Uh, and, and for the father of child, children in diapers, it wasn't very hard for me to, for one scent to just come right into my nose uh, as I was thinking about that. Uh, but dirty diapers and, and the imagination, everything in hell will be much, much worse than those stinky, dirty diapers. And can you believe it? We actually, with our first child, we did cloth diapering. We wanted to be eco-friendly. As you had more children, we kind of moved on to throwing the diapers away. St. Ignatius then challenges us to think about our mortal sins. Well, which ones? Which mortal sins? Every single mortal sin we've ever committed in our entire lives. So why don't we just do that? Why don't we just take two minutes right now to think about the mortal sins. Just one of them, just one mortal sin would damn us to hell forever if we died without confessing that. So let's take St. Ignatius up. Let's think about our mortal sins. I might suggest looking at high school, looking at college, uh, maybe look, hopefully not last night, but just thinking about some of those mortal sins that you may have committed in your life. We'll just take two minutes, maybe close your eyes, think about that right now. Just one of those sins could have sent us to hell if we would have died. So let's pray. I'll, I'll, I'll just lead us in an act of contrition, asking God for his mercy. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all of my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all of my love, I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. There's multiple ways of saying that, so we, we're on the same page there. Thank you very much. Um, so what kind of mortal sins are leading us, leading people to hell? Again, we turn to Fatima, and Our Lady revealed that the sin that leads the most souls to hell, sins of the flesh. And that's no surprise. Uh, remember Father Donald Calloway, when he spoke to us many years ago, he got up here and he, he told us that the sin that they most frequently hear in confession is the sins of the flesh. So it's no, no surprise to us. Um, but again, think about that. Our Lady came with an urgent message, an urgent warning, a dire message, and said, you know, the sins which cause most souls to go to hell is the sins of the flesh. Just one unconfessed sin, remember, can lead us to hell. And what do we think? So you go to the gentleman's club, quote-unquote gentleman's club, and lust a little while and get in your car and get hit by a truck, boom, on the way home. And you go before the just judge and explain that to him. I was just a private little, little fun I was having. The sins which cause most souls to go to hell are sins of the flesh. And as we saw in Pennsylvania and with Cardinal McCarrick, our priests are not immune from this challenge from Our Lady. Another thing Saint, uh, Sister Lucia, one of the Fatima, Fatima visionaries, said was that the devil is trying to break up our families. She says, I want to quote this, this is very powerful. She says, the final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. She says, don't be afraid because whoever works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought against and opposed in every way because this is the decisive issue. She said, nevertheless, Our Lady has already crushed Satan's head. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm not a prophet. I haven't had any visions of Our Lady that I know of. Uh, and, and yet, you know, we have to take this message seriously. The devil is a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. This first part of the talk is very dark, very heavy, deadly serious. But it's also something that we have to take seriously. One of the scariest things I've ever read is, is in the catechism. So if you guys could get your catechisms out. I thought this was the Connecticut Catholic Men's Conference. Okay, who, who did I steal that joke from? Harold Burke Sivers. Remember Deacon Harold? He came here and, and uh, asked you to get your Bibles out, and everybody's like... I don't expect you. And I remember the next year that I was talking to people, and they brought their Bibles. 
So next year, people are going to bring a locker full of books. They'll have their catechism and their Bibles. But this is uh, in the Catechism, chapter six, or paragraph 675. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Before Christ comes again, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Now, again, I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying that this is going to happen tomorrow or a week from now or five years from now or a hundred years from now. But the catechism teaches very clearly that we will have to go through a trial, a final trial, before the end of time, and it will shake our faith. So what do we need to do now to make sure that our faith stays strong in the midst of what could come tomorrow, a week from now, or 50 years from now? We need to arm ourselves right now to be ready for that attack. Souls, our souls, our family souls are on the line right now. We cannot go out into the world. This is our theme this year, go out into the world. We cannot go out into the world if we're not prepared for the attacks of the devil, which I told you about from the exorcist. They are, the exorcist tells me men are being fully attacked right now. Take out the father of the home and you take the children with him. So, going back to this reading from 1 Peter 5, the devil is a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. So what do we need to do right now to remain solid in the faith? How do we resist the devil? And I think again of what happened 100 years, 101 years ago when Our Lady came to Fatima. I think she gave us a blueprint for holiness, sort of packed us with ammo to, to fight this spiritual battle. And uh, what did she say there at Fatima? She gave us the staircase to heaven. She said, pray the rosary what, once a week. No, every single day. Pray the rosary every single day. She said, fast and pray for sinners. It's pretty incredible to think about in the rich tradition of the church, even like 50, 60 years ago, Catholics would fast every single day of Lent, except for Sundays and major feast days. Every day of Lent they were fasting. So you know how we have like Good Friday and Ash Wednesday? Well, our Catholic ancestors, our grandparents, they would fast every day of Lent. You know, it was, every day was Ash Wednesday, every day was Good Friday, according to that, to that tradition. We had uh, ember days, which were the turning of the season. So there was three days every turn of the season, so four times a year times three days, that's 12 fast days as well. And then also on the vigils of major feast days like Pentecost, there would be another fast day. So again and again, our Catholic tradition was equipping us to, to, do, the, to do the fasting. And why do we need to fast? What, what, what is the reason of fasting? Well, our Lord, right, what did he say? The, the disciples went out and they couldn't heal. And they said, how come we couldn't heal these people? And, and Jesus said, certain things require not just prayer, but prayer and fasting. So we've got that command from our Lord to fast. We've got that command from Our Lady to do penance for sinners. That's the challenge today. To find some of these lost treasures of fasting, maybe every day of Lent or the Ember Days or the Vigil of Pentecost, to, to dig up these lost treasures. And it's exciting to find these lost treasures in our tradition, right? To, to be able to find these beautiful things that our ancestors did and to say, you know what, I'm going to give that a try. That sounds like a, a good way to grow, grow in holiness. And, and we know why it's so necessary, right? We, we see the headlines as I started at the beginning of what happened in Pennsylvania, what happened with Cardinal McCarrick. The need for holiness is so great. And we, EWTN just did a poll of Catholics across the country, a scientific poll, and uh, we found that 35% of Catholics across the country are going to Mass every Sunday. 35%. Where in the world is everybody else? I mean, they cannot be in this battle for the salvation of souls. They're not coming to at least church on Sunday. So Our Lady says, pray the rosary every day. She says, fast. Pray for sinners. And then she also asks us to do the five first Saturdays. And I really feel like looking at that, the five first Saturdays, it's the five consecutive first Saturdays of the month, first Saturday, uh, to confession, communion, rosary, meditation. And if you look at all of those, I really feel like that is a blueprint for daily holiness. Not that we have to go to confession every day. Uh, I think the if that was the case, you may need to talk to the priest about that. But just this idea of confession. 
as we looked at with St. Ignatius, right, one of those mortal sins would have damned us to hell. Just one. Just one. So think about your sins and, and confess them. And, and, and doing the first Saturdays ensures that at least once a month you'll be going to confession. I personally have thought that's a pretty good start, but personally myself, uh, I, I feel like it's just not good enough for myself. Uh, I, I feel like once I start getting not going uh, every, every couple of weeks, two, twice a week or so, I, I start getting into ruts, spiritual ruts. I start getting impatient with my, with my kids when they're treating my back like a jungle gym. Uh, I get uh, upset with people at work. I let that pride, you know, when, when one of my scripts gets edited and I'm like, the pride just starts eating up inside. I'm like, oh, that was so beautiful. I was like Dante, I'm a poet. You know, and that pride just starts eating up when I don't go to confession regularly. I feel like going, going regularly does keep me accountable. It, it helps to uh, keep my spiritual life in, in a regular place of accountability, focused on God. I feel like if I, if I go just once a month, I feel like it, it, for me, it's just too long. I start getting lazy with prayers. You know, the bed looks pretty attractive for night prayers. I'm going to get in bed. I'll, I'll do prayers at 3 in the morning, which never happens. Grace, as St. Thomas says, grace builds on nature. So when we go to confession, grace of that sacrament gives us the power to overcome those sins. So if you think about sins that maybe you, you dealt with a little bit when you were younger and, and you went to confession and you kind of fought that sin, and you had the grace to overcome it. This is true for men who have struggled with pornography or masturbation or other things like that. So Our Lady says go to confession. We know that. That's very powerful. We had the opportunity to do that today. Uh, the second thing she says is to pray the rosary. And I know this is a very difficult thing for me personally. Uh, you know, I, I get through the two decades and I'm like, well, maybe I got an email that came in for work. Maybe, well, what's in the fridge? Maybe there's something good there to, to drink. Uh, no, I just want to put my head down and take a nap. And it's kind of like when you were in sixth grade and you had to run the mile. Uh, and you get to like three-fourths of the way done, and you're like, I think at this point I'm just going to need to stop and walk the rest of the mile. But if you just keep going, you push through that wall, you're, you get through the mile, and then like when you get to the finish line, you're actually sprinting. It feels really good. It's a, a thrill. And I think that's the same thing with the rosary. Is, you know, once you get through half of the way, you just keep going through that wall, and you get it done every single day. She asks for it every single day. Why do we want to pray it? She knows better than us. That's why. She's asking us to pray that. She came with this message of mercy 101 years ago. Also, we can look at our history books and look at this Catholic tradition, the Battle of Lepanto, October 7th, 1571. The Muslim Turks were, had a big, bigger fleet than the Christians, and they were wanting, they had their eyes set on taking Italy, and then from Italy, maybe the whole of Europe. And Pope Pius V, who was a Dominican, he asked all of the Christians to pray their rosary for victory. And even though they were outnumbered by the Turks, by the Muslims, Pope Pius V, who was hundreds of miles away from the battle, he went to the window and he said, the Christian fleet has been victorious. And it was true. The Christians, through the power of people across the continent praying their rosary, were able to defeat a menacing foe. Just think if the Muslims would have taken Italy and taken all over Europe at that point. That's the power of the rosary. If you want to know about the power of the rosary, look at Blessed Bartolo Longo. You can ask him. He was a Satanist. He was, he's a blessed, but he was a Satanist at one time. And Blessed Longo also was a Satanic priest. But at one point, the Dominicans gave him a rosary. And somehow, he developed a love of the rosary and it led him to conversion. He became Catholic. He set up a beautiful rosary shrine. Ask Blessed Longo about the power of the rosary. Thinking about the, the Dominicans, you know, all these stories have been about Dominicans, They're the preachers of the rosary. Uh, think about the Dominicans in New Haven, right? If you've ever been down to St. Mary's where I was a parishioner, I loved being a parishioner there. Uh, they, would, uh, they, they wear their rosary right here on, 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 their, on their hip. Why do they wear it on that hip? Because it's their weapon. It's ready at a moment's notice to be drawn. Spiritual weapon. Right? St. Padre Pio, he said his rosary was his weapon as well. 
It helps them to fight evil. It helps them to fight heresy. It helps them to fight the devil, who's a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Father Peyton was an American priest, and he was a rosary crusader. He would go across the country and urge people to pray their rosary. And his famous quote, which you may have heard, is, what is it? Yeah. The family that prays together stays together. And that's something that I learned from my in-laws as I secretly flew out to Michigan to ask my future bride's uh, uh, father for her, for her hand in marriage. Uh, we had a little chat, and uh, he said, well, one, we don't believe in divorce, and number two, we believe in praying the rosary every day to keep that family together. And so I look at some of his, some of his children. There's a, he's got uh, one of our sister-in-laws is in, in New York, and she's got a family of seven wonderful, beautiful children and, uh, and again, they kept that tradition alive of praying that rosary every day. And you see those little kids, you know, praying their rosary. And it's such a beautiful thing. And it kept that family together. So we've got the saints. We've got Our Lady urging us to pray the rosary. But how? There's the two parts of the rosary. There's the vocal prayers. You know, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, and if you think about it, and I love this little book by St. Louis de Montfort, it's called The Secret of the Rosary, and what is the secret of the rosary? It comes down to just do it, just pray the rosary. Like, I don't know how it's supposed to work, but they know, they're the spiritual masters, and they say, just do it, and it's going to transform your life, they say. And uh, he says, look at those prayers, right? The Our Father prayer was this, the very prayer that Jesus taught us. The Hail Mary prayer was a prayer that came from heaven to earth, Right? That beginning part of the prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, it's the angel's message. These are divine prayers from heaven that we get to pray every day. So that's the first part is the, the vocal prayers. And then the meditation, which puts us into the greatest story of history. We get to meditate. You know, the, the main focus of the rosary is to close our eyes and to enter into the story of Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. That's the key, is to focus on that meditation. And I know for me personally, meditation is very difficult, right? I'm sitting there praying the agony in the garden, the first sorrowful mystery. I'm praying there, I'm thinking, okay, Jesus is there in the garden. Yep, okay, blood coming down his brow in the garden. I gotta, my grass is too long. I mean, literally, my grass is, is really embarrassing right now. It's really bad. But after I cut the grass, I want to get a drink. I'm kind of dehydrated right now. I wonder what's in the fridge for dinner. And then by the time I get to the glory be, it's like, what did I just meditate on? I don't even know. I don't even know what that was. So yes, meditation can be tough. One tip that I learned in the last year, somebody wrote a book, and, and it's called like the John Paul II Method of Praying the Rosary, and he sent it to me in the mail. And uh, he said, you know, each Hail Mary, try to refocus on the mystery. So what I've done, he doesn't say this, but... If I'm praying privately, sometimes I'll say the name of the mystery at each Hail Mary. So the Annunciation, you know, say the Hail Mary. Amen. The Annunciation. And so that way it just keeps you kind of focused in that biblical, biblical account of our Lord's life. And what does St. Jerome say, right? Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. So when we pray our rosary, it puts us into the heart of the Bible. It helps us to keep from being ignorant of Christ. And I, I know... The rosary has been a blessing in my life. It challenged me one time when I was praying. I, I was in a chapel in Colorado, and I remember getting so annoyed. I, I used to get so annoyed at this chapel because everybody was, you know, chit-chatting, and it was really hard to focus on the prayers of the Mass. You know, beforehand, I wanted to pray and have quiet time, and I would just get so cold and bitter at these people. And uh, no offense if anybody hears a chatter. Uh, but I, I just was getting really cold. I was getting really bitter towards these people. And I remember praying that second joyful mystery, which is the visitation, right? When, when Our Lady, pregnant with Jesus, went to St. Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist, and J-Bap, as we like to call him. Uh, uh, J-Bap leapt in the womb at the presence of Christ. And as I was thinking about that, I was like, wait a minute. These people over here that I have been really bitter towards, they just received our Lord. They have our Lord in their bodies, and I am being cold to them. Like, this mystery is telling me to leap for joy at their presence. Like, I don't have to be best friends with them, but they have Christ in them, and all I should be doing is leaping for joy at their presence among me.
The Catechism teaches that the tempter wants to keep us, does everything he can to keep us away from prayer. And uh, like I said earlier, you know, well, let's check and see how many likes I have on Twitter. Or let's, uh, it's time to put a rosary, but I think it's time maybe to check Facebook and see if I have any likes on that picture I put up. Or, you know, so the devil's trying to like, keep us from praying, right? And then it gets to the end of the day and it's like, oh, time to go to bed. I don't have time for this. We have to meditate on the mysteries, right? There's a 15 minutes a day, the birth, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Uh, this is what Our Lady had asked of us at Fatima. Confession, pray the rosary, and then she asked us to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary for, for another 15 minutes. And uh, meditation is such a great gift. And as I said, it's, it's also very difficult. But uh, we have a lot of roadmaps for meditation, looking at the lives of our saints and, and their writings. Uh, for example... St. Uh, Francis de Sales says, you know, you should spend 30, hour, 30 minutes in prayer a day, and if you're too busy for 30 minutes, then you need to pray an hour a day. And these are the spiritual masters. These are the ones that are teaching us what we need to do. So, too busy for 30, make it an hour, okay? So, what a, what a meditation. And one of my first meditations I think I learned was just reflecting on the Our Father prayer. And just letting each phrase of that Our Father ruminate in my mind, just taking it very slowly. Um, Our Father, so visualizing, closing my eyes, visualizing God in heaven, the one who created the world. Visualizing Our Father who art in heaven, visualizing heaven, visualizing the light, the angels and the saints bowing down in front of him. Hallowed be his name, you know, bowing down at the magnificence of God and his beautiful light. A kingdom come, asking myself, you know, is God, is Christ the king of my heart? You know, have I given him the time in prayer? No. Has, has he taken over my family life? No. Has he, has he been the king of my heart? Has he been the king of our country? I mean, look at how crazy everything is right now in our country, in our world, and in our, even in our church. Is he the king of our hearts, of our church, of our world? Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, what is God asking me to do right now? What is God asking me to do? Give us to stay our daily bread. What, what are my needs right now? What, what, what people had asked for prayers. What were some of those prayers they needed to offer to, people, to God? Forgive us our trespasses. What sins have I committed? As we forgive those who trespass against us. Which person am I not you know, really happy about right now? Which person am I? I'm not going to take a call from him. You know, which, which people are we not willing to forgive? Lead us not into temptation. Can we see the angels protecting us from the, the battle for souls that's waging all around us right now? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see God slamming the hell, slamming Satan into hell. So let's just, right now, just close our eyes. I'll set the clock for two minutes. Just meditate, you know, you don't have to get through the whole Our Father, but just take a chance now to just think about each of those phrases. You can, you know, however far you need to get in two minutes, we'll just take a little time right now to, to meditate on the, 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 the Our Father. Be it, we trust in God, he heard our prayer. St. Jerome says the Amen, which is part of the prayer, is the seal of the prayer. St. Ignatius of Loyola says, you know, we should do that meditation we just did for an hour a day. <laughs> Or at least, sorry, he said you should do that meditation for at least an hour. So just think about if you were to take those prayers, uh, the, each of the words of the prayer, and, and reflect upon them and allow them to sink deep into your heart, right? And then at the end, amen, right? God, Jesus says, if you, you, know, if you knock at the door, he's going to answer, right? We just presented God all these prayers and worries for the world and our church and our hearts and our families, and so be it. May his will be done, Amen. St. Teresa says you shouldn't overthink your meditations. She says, you know, one of the keys is just visualize Christ. Just, you know, close your eyes, see Christ. You know, I, you know, maybe make eye contact, just your eyes upon his eyes, lovingly looking at you. He, he loves you. Just, that's a meditation right there. Just very simple. So you can do that on, you know, while you're waiting at the doctor's office. You could do that if you take, like I do the subway to work. But you can just close your eyes for a couple minutes and visualize Christ who loves us so much. So let's, let's focus on that meditation now for another two minutes. Let's just close our eyes, visualize Christ in front of us, 
eye to eye, heart to heart, talking. Just if you want more, that, that's sort of the free form meditation, but if you want more sort of step by step approach to meditation, St. Ignatius gives you these all these steps, you know, even starting before you take your chair or your knee or just, you know, preparing for your meditation and saying, you know, I'm going to meet God in that chair and God's looking at me and, and you take your seat. You, there's all these steps to the meditation. But again, you just get into that biblical story. You, you visualize Christ. If it's our motto here, go into the whole world. You would visualize Christ on the mountain, you know, telling you to go out into the whole world. You visualize every step of that, every step of him talking heart to heart to you. That's what St. Ignatius would do. And he says, you know, just, just spend the time doing that. One of my favorite meditations is Lexio Divina. Uh, it's what monks do every day, all day long. And it's a slow munching on the word of God. You just think about God created with his word, with his, with his word alone, created out of nothing. He created the stars. He created the animals. He created the planets, the water. He created you. He created human, man, and woman. With his powerful word. Through his word, we're forgiven of our sins. Through his word, the bread and wine is turned into the body and blood of Christ. So just think about how powerful God's word is and he can create with his powerful word what he can do just in our own personal lives. So we're going to do a little Lexio Divina. It's a four steps uh, meditation. And, uh, you know, thinking about the power of the scriptures, look at St. Augustine, right? He was struggling with, he had a child out of wedlock, he had a mistress, uh, he, he wasn't following the uh, Catholic faith. His mother, Monica, was praying incessantly for his conversion. I'm not sure about Chandler and Joey and all the other friends. <laughs> My brother wanted me to say that. He's a, a Navy pilot. He's a, he flies uh, fighter jets. He, he said I had to have more jokes in this talk. So that, <laughs> that was his. So if you liked it, you can t -t 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 for him. Uh, but anyway, St. Augustine, right? He, he heard... Take and read, take and read, take and read. He's like, what are these kids? I mean, I've never heard that chant from at the playground before. What's this, what's this chant, take and read? And so he picked up the Bible, and, and the, the biblical verse spoke right to his doubts. It was a lesson from St. Paul uh, about rioting and drunkenness, and boom, the darkness of his doubt just disappeared. Uh, St. Anthony of the Desert, one of the early uh, church, one of the first uh, monks, he had a similar experience. He had an inheritance and he wasn't sure what to do with, with this money and his, his life. And he was trying to make sense of what to do. And the gospel reading that hit him over the head like a two by four was, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And boom, like that two by four to the head, it transformed his life and he became a, a monk. And if you ever want to read some beautiful writing, St. Athanasius wrote, the biography of St. Anthony of the Desert. And it's incredible all that he went through, all the demonic... Uh, temptations and things like that that he had to battle out in the wilderness. But he's a, a, a role model for us in, in the spiritual life. So we're going to do this Lexio Divina. We're going to reflect upon it. It's, uh, it's four steps. Uh, Lexio, which is reading the Bible slowly, allowing it to sink in. Wait for a word or a phrase that hits you, like it hit these two saints I mentioned. And then just keep that word, ponder that word or that phrase in your, in your, in your mind. What is God trying to say? He's speaking to you through this powerful word. What is the message he's trying to say to you? So Lexio is the first read. Meditate, second, thinking about what that word or phrase is. And then third is prayer. It's that heart to heart. It's two friends just talking, chatting. That, that's the third step. And then the fourth step is contemplation. You brought all of your worries to God, all the craziness going on in the world, and God has heard us. Jesus has heard us. And then you can just rest. That heart to heart. You know, the beloved, we don't have to say anything. We can just rest in God's love and peace. So we have a few minutes left. So we'll just do this meditation on our reading from the gospel, uh, which is going to the whole world. So I'll read it once. Then I'm going to read it again very slowly. On the second read, let that word pop in. Let, let God's word pop into your heart. A reading from the gospel. Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will be accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak new languages, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. 
So I'm going to read it slowly. You can close your eyes. Let, wait for a word or a phrase to hit you. Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak new languages. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So we did the Lexio. Now we're going to move into meditation with that phrase or that word that God spoke to you. Just ponder it in your head. You can keep your eyes closed. We'll just do a short meditation here. Just let God speak to you through that word. You can repeat that word yourself a few times and just reflect on what that word means to you. Staying in this prayer, we're going to move now into talking heart to heart with Jesus in front of us. What is he telling us? What do we want to say to him? Let's have that one-on-one -on -one heart to heart with Jesus. Finally, in this prayer, let's continue with contemplation. Let's just rest knowing that we're in the presence of our God and King. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. This reminds us of the fact that the Catholic, the Bible is a Catholic book. I remember one time a mentor had put the Bible in front of me and said, you know, show me anywhere in there that proves what you Catholics believe. And I was like 18 or 19, I was like a deer in the headlights, and I was like, I... I, I know that Mother Teresa likes to serve the poor. That's in the Bible. And my friend rescued me from this sort of doubt that I was having about the faith and told me, go to this website, catholic.com, and they have, it's Catholic Answers, and they have all kind of answers about everything. You know, Jesus founded the church. You know, the sacraments all came from Christ. You know, this is my body, this is my blood. Go out. You know, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. He breathed on them and said, you know, forgive people's sins. So all these things are in the Bible. The Bible is a Catholic book, and it's so great to be able to meditate upon it. So meditation is that other part of the Fatima message, right? We talked about confession, the rosary, meditation. She asked that we, on the first Saturday of the month, meditate about one of the 
themes of the, of the mysteries of the rosary, so resurrection or descent of the Holy Spirit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I know sometimes meditation can be boring, you know, but just through the good times and bad, like when you get married, right, you, you promise that you're going to be faithful. And so just be faithful to that meditation. Uh, Father Riberger, who's one of the exorcists, he has great videos on uh, YouTube that you can watch. He says set that time, just set that appointment with meditation every single day, whether it's waking up a half an hour early or, or doing it after work or whatever, just set that appointment to have that time for meditation. And then finally, communion, right? That's the last part of what Our Lady, that, that plan that she gave us at Fatima. And uh, I'm running out of time, but just the, the fact that I was in college when I first experienced Eucharistic adoration. How in the world did I go my whole life without learning that Jesus was truly present in the Eucharist? But I was at Eucharistic adoration. I don't know why I actually went there for that. But in the darkness and the candles were, were blinking and the whiffs of incense were, were going up into the, into the sky and they were chanting this beautiful hymn. And right there, God spoke, he just pierced my heart and said, you know, I am present in this. This is my body. Right? What did he say at the Last Supper? This is a symbol of my body. This is my grape juice. No. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. And it was, it was such a great blessing that transformed my entire life that at that moment in my heart, he was, I, I knew he was present on that altar. I wanted to talk about community and the value of having friendships and things like that. I kind of am running out of time, but just community is also something that we need to stabilize us when it comes to fighting the demonic forces that the exorcist told me about. I'm thinking about my own community in Hyattsville. The, the school, Catholic school, was on the list to be closed. And uh, some of the parents got together and they're like, well, it's just pretty much public school curriculum. They have a religion class and they have prayer tacked on. So they said, why don't we try something totally revolutionary? So they came up with this whole new curriculum, classical curriculum, uh, based you know, on the wisdom of the ages and philosophy and all this. And surely what happened? Did the school closed? No. It grew leaps and bounds to the fact that now, this last year, there were so many people that they had to admit for kindergarten, must admit for those who are siblings of older students, they have to admit them. There were so many must admits that they were going to have to reject every new student coming into the school for kindergarten. And my son was going to be one of those rejected, but thankfully they prayed very hard over Holy Week and the school was able to open up a, a, a new kindergarten. Uh, people are moving into the neighborhood. Um, because of the school, it's kind of walking distance. It's really cool. We've got the restaurants and the shopping, the coffee shop, the church, all within walking distance. Moms, those who are staying at home, have uh, rosary moms once a week where they get together and pray the rosary or they have Bible studies. Some of the men, we have a, we have a listserv where we'll email prayer intentions or we'll say, my pipes froze this winter. What the heck? You know, how, what am I supposed to do about that? And so some of us younger dads get wisdom from the, from the older dads. It's a great, beautiful thing. But that community that helps us to grow in holiness, right? We, we challenge each other to, to show up for things like this men's conference, and that helps us to grow in holiness. So the value of friendship, the value of community, is what's also needed here as we think about fighting the devil. So again, in, in summary, the devil is a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him solid in the faith. The devil is prowling. We saw that in Pennsylvania. We saw that with Cardinal McCarrick. He wants to attack manhood. We've got these, we've got the spiritual ammo for Saturdays. Yeah. You're running late. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly, exactly. Uh, so what is the first Saturdays again? Confession, rosary, meditation, communion. That's a powerhouse of prayer, retreat and holiness, a model that we can use in every day of our lives. Confess, pray, receive Jesus as much as, as, as possible. It's an arsenal of ammo in these dark times. You know, God has not abandoned us. We, we must go with our motto there. We must take time for meditation. We must take time for prayer. Fasting, prayer, confession, rosary, meditation. Meditations on our Father, St. Teresa's meditation, St. Ignatius, Lexio Divina, communion. It's an unstoppable power that we get. Because again, like we said from the beginning, that our opponent is the devil. He's prowling like a lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith.